All right, Keith, uh, thanks for talking to us. So uh, one way we could do this is go through your whole backstory, but there's some other stuff I want to talk to. Maybe we'll circle back. So maybe if you could just kind of give like a, at a high level, you know, what you do and uh, what you've done for like the last few years. Yeah, um, I am an entrepreneur and an investor. Um, my day job is uh, building companies and my, my evening job is investing in companies in the technology space. And I spent the last 10 years, uh, or I guess eight, eight years running a company called Mystery, um, which created digital lessons for teachers to use in classrooms, uh, specifically elementary teachers, and mostly helping them teach science. Um, and I should mute my, my audio before we get too far into this. So why don't I, why don't I go ahead and do that? Because I will continue to get Slack messages all, all day long. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, how are you thinking about this? Are you, do you want me to like start from the top so that you, you can have like a single cut or, or. Yeah, let's just go ahead and okay. do that. We, we were early enough into it. Actually, I need to check my. <laughs> yeah, okay. I should. Let me Good. check. Sometimes I have Slack open in multiple places. Let me just make sure I don't have anywhere else. I've been doing these for years and I still slip <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I think we're silent now. Uh, you were asking, oh, what have I been doing? Um, so yeah, I was saying, um, so I'm an entrepreneur and investor. Uh, my day job is building companies, and uh, but I spend a, a fair amount of time investing as well in technology companies. And so for the last eight years, I spent building uh, Mystery. Uh, that was the name of the company. I was co-founder and CEO of the company. And we built a set of uh, digital lessons designed for elementary teachers to use in the classroom to help them teach their students. Our most popular ones were science lessons. And so Mystery Science and Mystery Doug were, were our two products that, that were helping teachers teach science. Um, and that's it's now the most popular science curriculum used in schools across the country. We're in about 60% of elementary schools, some, some worldwide usage as well outside of the US, but that's been my focus for, for a while. Um, and, and just last year, sold the company to Discovery Education and um, I'm working on a new company now called The Explanation Company. So one of the reasons I was eager to talk to you is uh, I remember a few years ago I was having a conversation with your co-founder at Mystery, Doug Peltz, and he was telling me about kind of just what an astonishing experience. His background had been teaching and he, I, I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but it was something like he expected, you know, like, okay, we'll just come up with a product and we'll put it out there. And he said that you had just, you're so rigorous about like every step of the way, kind of validating what you're doing and I wonder, and so I thought it'd be really interesting to kind of uh, go sort of step by step, or at least some of the steps through the process of, you know, how you're judging an idea and then how you're starting to implement it when you have no real clue yet what might work, what might not. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I think um, the, they're two very different questions. And so it's worth maybe saying a little bit about each of them and, and, and you know, cut me off and jump in. But um, I mean, I think thinking about, yeah, so, so at a really high level, it's a sort of two-step process of like being convinced that there is a business opportunity in a given area, or, or, or um, to say that another way, being convinced that, there's, that it's worth trying to solve a particular problem, but then figuring out how to solve it. Like what's the particular solution, which will have some sort of success in the marketplace, basically. Um, and you can be right about one, but not the other. Um, and, and it just, you know, you don't have a successful business. One of the reasons that I like personally, um, one of the reasons I so enjoy investing is, is, is that it teaches me, it helps build the muscle for the first step of that process, which is mm -hmm. evaluating good business opportunities and, and identifying at a high level kind of attributes of a company which contribute to its potential success in the marketplace, which is an important first step before you then sort of embark on figuring out, all right, I'm convinced there is a problem here. How do I solve this problem with, with a product that I can sell successfully? Do you think that the skill for number one is something that you had to cultivate? Like what your first business, uh, what convinced you to start that? Um, I, I do think it's, a, I think it's a skill that someone can cultivate. Um, you know, I, I think some people are probably naturally better at it than others just because of the, of the sort of things they like to study in the world or the news they read or, or kind of the, the perspective they take on things. Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I've, I've met people over the years who, who are really interested in starting a business, 
but didn't have a, a particularly good idea. And, and I think it's possible to do that. And, and th that was my early business. Like the very, I don't know what I count as the first business that I started. Like I had a lawn mowing business in the very early days and I had great idea, business, you know, building computers for people where I'd buy, you know, they wanted a computer, I'd buy all the pieces, put it together and then sell it for more than the sum of the parts. And, um, and then I had an early web design business and, you know, so one pattern with those businesses is like, it's really clear someone wants that. Like lots of people want their lawn mowed and lots of people want to buy, wanted to buy computers, uh, you know, the old kind back then. And, and, and so those are, that's an easy way to, to build a successful business is to, to, to not take, uh, you know, there's one way I've heard this phrase is there's idea risk and execution risk. Mm -hmm. um, and it's nice if, to not take idea risk, you know, to know that you have a good idea because lots of other people do it. And then, and then put all your risk on the execution side. Like as long as you work hard and do a good job, then, then there's a certain amount of success you can achieve with it. Yeah, but I imagine that the upside, both financially, but even sort of just feeling like you're really contributing something like innovative and useful is lower there, right? Because it's, all right, here's a solved problem versus there's problems out there that are unsolved. Um, I don't know about that. I mean, I think I, I, I would be, I'd have to think about that more, but I would hesitate to generalize that, that, um, you know, if there's a problem that's already solved out there, but you, and you just want to solve it too, for, for a different set of people, and maybe even solve it a little better, you, there can be a lot of economic value in solving a solved problem just a little better than, than, than it's usually solved. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, like I had an early web design company, you know, when I was a, a freshman in college and I had just learned to program and I thought I could make good money doing that. And I didn't turn that into a particularly big business, but there are, there are huge businesses that basically write custom websites for people or do, do custom software development for people. So, um, so for the most part, I don't think that one, one doesn't inherently lead to, I think, a bigger opportunity than another. Um, so, but then let's... <clears throat> So it is though a unique kind of step, right? To be able to think, all right, here's a business that doesn't exist and I'm going to start it and see what happens. And so you talked about, you know, just being really convinced yourself that like, this could be a good idea. Like this really is solving an important problem. Are there sort of any universal aspects of reaching that conclusion? In particular, I'm interested in, is there any sort of like, you know, gut checks you do to make sure like, am I kidding myself because I, I know I've definitely had great ideas that I realized after a while, that's actually a really bad idea. Um, I, I don't know if I've thought about this enough to have great sort of general principles. Um, you know, in, in one sense of the word, like a, what, one way to restate your question is like, how do you come up with, is there a formula for coming up with really good original insights that other people haven't come up with? And to some extent, if there were a formula for that, then, then there wouldn't be you know, good original insights to have. So I think I'd be a little flip about it by, by saying it that way. I mean, I think there are, uh, you know, let, let me think about kind of interesting gut checks that I might use to, to, to sort of think if I'm on the right track. I mean, I have and, and I in no way think that this is the right way to start a business because I think you can build business both ways. But I, I personally am really motivated to, I, I get excited about new, new trends in technology, new cultural trends, new, new shifts in consumer behavior. Those things have always interested me. Like I'm the kind of person from as long as I can remember, um, I love consumer products generally. I, um, toys is one category of consumer products that I love. And, you know, as long as I can remember, I love you know, walking down the toy aisle and just seeing, you know, what are new things that are coming out? And there's an international, uh, there's a New York International Toy Fair every year. And I find that a particularly interesting category to see, you know, what innovation is happening in that, in that category. So, so, so with, um, you know, I've, I've long had that bent towards things, but one of the, I, I think that, I guess to the extent there's a formula, like the basic formula that I use is simply, I love learning about um, new technologies that are coming out. I mean, I, I, advancements in science and technology generally, but technology in particular, I love understanding, you know, what's coming out, what are the new capabilities, like what's possible today that wasn't possible a year ago. And once I understand, you know, really intimately what, what the, the new things are that are possible, the, the, if there's a, a, an opportunity to marry those new possibilities with kind of age old problems or, or, or problems that I'm particularly interested in. And so, so to make that concrete, you know, I'm, I, 
I am as interested in, in most of the major technology trends today. So I've spent a ton of time with virtual reality and augmented reality. I think it's really fascinating how far the technology's come in the last five years. I think there's a lot of interesting potential for, for, for what comes out in the future. And I've spent a lot of time in my headset studying like what works well and what doesn't well and, um, and you know, reading online about the most popular apps and trying those out and, and, and developing a, at least a, a hypothesis about why some apps are popular and not others and, and what I think might be the next wave of this thing. Um, you know, and, and similarly with, with blockchain technology and with, with artificial You were the first person who to told me about Uber. We were visiting you back in the days before uh, Uber X, right? It was still the black cars. And my wife and I were driving around San Francisco or taking taxis around. And of course, it was like this nightmare of you end up somewhere and you don't know what time you're going to get home because you could be waiting forever. And you're like, why don't you use Uber? Like, what's <laughs> Uber? And I said, this is, it was the only way to get through San Francisco. But then it was just this amazing to see it blow up. And that was probably relatively late from your perspective. But for me, I was like, oh, I'm on the cutting edge of... Yeah, I mean, I, th there's a great famous quote, um, the future is already here, it's just not widespread. And so, you know, one of the things to, to be able to predict the future or see the future is at least live at the edge of it. So I, I, I get a lot of pleasure and, and just, just it's fun for me to use new technologies, to use new apps. And so when I hear about things, I'm often using them sooner than most other people. And that just gives you a peek around the corner of what's coming. Um, I, I do want to get to the second part of what you said, but this is kind of, I think, a natural place to ask something else I want to ask you. So you um, recently published a piece, I think it was in the Andreessen Horowitz Future uh, publication, where you were kind of looking at, like, what's the future of the internet for kids? And it, to me, what was so striking is you were diagnosing a problem that as soon as you named it, it, it seemed completely true. And yet I've never seen anybody name it, which was like, to the extent the internet is for kids, it's only because we've taken like an adult thing and, and kind of scrubbed some stuff out of there. So Netflix is just Netflix, but for, with children program. But like so much of what we do that's exciting in the web is like, oh, I'm really fascinated by, you know, um, oh, I just got really into baseball. Let me like learn everything about its history, my favorite teams. And that kind of like curiosity seeking is not open to children on the internet. And I mean, you gave some other examples for that. And I'm, and so you mentioned sort of just being on the cutting edge of technology and what's newly possible, but there's also that kind of like thinking about like, what haven't we taken it? I guess it's the same question, right? What haven't we taken advantage of from this technology? So is that sort of how you would think about a problem? Like with the, the case of like kids in the internet or are there yeah, other... I mean I think there's a general muscle, um, you know, another muscle which can help, you know, I don't feel like I, I have a formula for spotting good ideas, but another muscle that can help is in general, seeing things as they could be, not just as they are. And, and you know, I think about that, like my wife and I go out to dinner at a restaurant and, and you know, there's the evaluation of like, oh, did we enjoy this restaurant or not? Did we enjoy this meal or not? But there's the next level of evaluation, which is, gosh, what, what, how could this experience have been? Like, what would it have taken to make this experience better, whether it's the dish or the ambiance or, or whatnot? So I think there is a muscle that you can cultivate too, to see things as they could be, not as they are. And so, um, you know, with, yes, the, the particular uh, opportunity that you're referring to that I wrote about, this is the opportunity I'm most excited about these days. And I don't think it's the biggest opportunity out there, but I think it's a big opportunity that's interesting. And, and, and as you said, it's around children using the internet. And for me, this, this one is, you know, I grew up with the internet. Like I remember the, the sort of pre-web days of the internet. And then I remember the AOL CompuServe days of the internet. And then I remember the early web and starting to use Netscape and Mosaic as these browsers and kind of the evolution over time. And uh, my, my son is 10 years old. So 10 years ago, I became a father. And then as my son turned two and three and four, and he started entering this age of intense curiosity, where he had a hundred questions a day about the world and about things he was noticing. Like, you know, why do magnets stick to the fridge when, when they're not sticky, dad? And, you know, as, as a parent, you're like, oh, that is really weird. Yeah, most things you see in life stick because they're sticky, but there's something weird about magnets. Or, you know, we walk outside and he's like, why is water falling from the sky? And I'm like, oh, it's raining. It's the first time he's seen rain. And he's like, but how did it get up in the sky? 
And, you know, to see the world through a child's eyes, you, you know, you, you appreciate again how, how it's like a series of magic tricks unfolding around you. So, so I just saw my son being incredibly curious about things and, and I became aware of my own behavior around how I would answer his questions and when we'd buy a book for him or when I wasn't available, what would he do independently or not do independently? And, uh, you know, a few years into, you know, maybe when he was four or five, I think he started to use our iPad for various things. And I just saw... For me, it, it looked almost obvious. Like I saw my my son in 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 the AOL days of the internet all over again. Like his his AOL, you know, I remember using AOL, and it's this little kind of like great curated experience. And there was an AOL keyword for everything, like NFL or or Basset Hounds or whatever. There was an AOL keyword for everything. And you'd see the AOL page for that thing. And so there's a sense in which it's like, oh, this has everything, right? You know, now we use the modern web and it's like, oh my gosh, that was nothing compared to the web experience. And so I see my son with the equivalent of that, but the AOL of today is YouTube. Like YouTube felt like his entire internet experience and then eventually the app store. So YouTube plus the app store was like what he thought of as the entire experience of the internet. And, and meanwhile, it's just interesting to think about how rarely the, the proportion of time I spent using the web as opposed to YouTube in the app store, like that's a much more limited internet experience. And so um, to me, that was almost an obvious gap when I looked at it through that lens. I mean, it's, it's funny. It kind of reminds me like you could make a strong argument that there's kind of people who either become entrepreneurs or comedians because with comedians, it's like this unique ability to be frustrated and annoyed by the things that everybody else take or amused, whatever, but by the things everybody takes for granted, right? Yeah. Like everybody yeah. has an opinion about is the restaurant good or bad, but it's that ability to say like, like, why do they do this with the napkins or, uh, I, sh I should have a better joke at the ready for that analogy, <laughs> but, um, but that, no, that's, I, I, I do think that's, that's a, a mental parallel. set you can cultivate. Yeah. I never thought about the parallel between, um, sort of the unique mindset that a comedian has to take or can take on the world to, to create fodder for their jokes, you know, and an entrepreneur takes on the world to identify opportunities to build a business. But yeah, that feels like there's a parallel there. That's insightful. So uh, let, let's take mystery as an example. I mean, it's the company you're in that I'm most familiar with. And yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I run into kids all the time um, you know, I would say at least a few times a year, just through random circumstances or teachers indeed, who like, will talk about mystery science and mystery dog. And I'm like, we know those guys. And they're <laughs> like, no, you don't like, you know, it's the rock stars of the, of the elementary school classroom. Yep. And, um, <clears throat> so what, what was the idea initially that sort of set everything in motion? Um, so I had children and my wife and I were visiting, um, Doug and his wife over Thanksgiving, uh, down at their house in Orange County. And I think we, we came in a couple days early and I watched Doug teach in the classroom and I actually taught a class to the, I think it was fifth grade science class. I forget what exactly the class was. And I taught a lesson on how computers work and I watched Doug teach. And it really gave me an appreciation watching Doug, Doug teach. It gave me an appreciation for how good he was at explaining things and how unique of approach, uh, unique, uh, how unique of an approach he took to, to, this, to this process. And, you know, we were in the early stages of thinking like, what were we going to do as parents and where we're going to send our kids to school. And, and I just knew I wanted my kids to get that experience. And, um, and so it just, it started with that motivation. It started with Doug and I having a shared perspective on the world and a shared conviction that, that the world is exciting and it's fun to explain things to, to people. And maybe there's an opportunity to explain things. And I knew I wanted to, to have my kids to get to the Doug experience of this. And we went looking for a business opportunity that could be married to that motivation. So, so, so I, you know, and I think this is an important aspect too. I think a great a great business to start is one that has a nice Venn diagram overlap between sort of a good business for you to run in a business that's worth building and worth running. Like there's, I feel like I've identified many business opportunities, which I didn't want to build, but I wish someone would. And I've, I've spent time trying to convince people to sort of pivot their business to tackle a problem that I want solved. And so this started with a particular motivation, like Doug and I had a shared interest and we went looking for, for a business opportunity. And we interviewed lots of parents and elementary teachers and and, and through a, a very systematic process of looking, we eventually found, oh, elementary teachers really wanted help answering kids' questions that come up in classrooms. 
And in particular, their questions about, uh, about the natural world, you know, the world around them that they were observing, which kids mostly ask questions about sort of the, the man-made world or the natural world or, or sort of society. So, you know, we call that sort of science and social studies as like the two subjects. And so that's what we focused on content wise. But those are the areas that teachers, elementary teachers were eager for help with. And so there started to be the emergence of, ooh, maybe this could align. And we built lots of prototypes and, and sort of figured out how to make it work. Well, it's so interesting to me that, I mean, in effect, like the, the first step was to sort, you had like a general idea of it would be good to do something like X, but then it was really searching for what's the problem. I know that, um, you know, I've been involved with, and even when I was younger, tried a couple things and see a lot of people where it's, you have kind of a thing you want to do. And so you start doing what you want to do and you sort of hope that somebody out there will want it. And almost always that doesn't work out. And it's, I feel like it's t- typically it's, there's something there you could have done that would have been valuable, but you didn't spot what it was that people actually wanted. You're trying to foist something on them that, that you thought would be good. I mean, this came up, you know, the previous place um, I worked with uh, our, our mutual friend, Alex Epstein, and, you know, he had wanted to teach businessmen philosophy to help empower them. And no, nobody in business wanted that. But then when he figured out how to do this in the realm of energy by helping people think through energy issues, there turned out to be huge demand for it because it was actually a problem that people wanted to solve. So it seems like, you know, the first thing was before you're even getting to the product stage, right? Like trying to understand the market and what are people unhappy about with the state of education? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think the, your, um, what you said about starting with with something that starting with an idea about something that you want or that you want to build, I think that's very often a good starting point. And and often the reason it doesn't work is is what you said. Like it, you didn't build the right version of it. And so how do you go from from ooh I want something for myself and I have some reason to think I'm not the only person. Like I have you know I, I've talked to a handful of people and I've identified multiple people who say they would like this kind of thing too. Yet I built it and no one's using it. Um, you know, I think there is a lot of subtle tweaking and refinement and iteration that needs to take place to sort of finally marry the two together. Um, you know, I often, I, I, I'm always very, uh, very resistant to an idea that, that people will often say, if someone ever had, oh shoot. All right. Am I back here? You're you, sorry. My you, screen you never went, went away. On. You just uh, got a little darker. Oh, my screensaver went on for a sec. So um, what was I saying? Uh, oh, um, so there's there's a common refra- refrain that people have in business, which is, oh, that's been tried before or someone else is already doing that. And I always have a very allergic reaction to that. Like I, I use the analogy of music. No musician ever says, oh, well, that song's been played before. Like, like musicians acknowledge that to do a small twist on an existing classic is, is a totally new song. And as consumers, you, you could love one, one particular version of a song in, deeply and not really like someone else in that song. And products are very much like that in the same way. Like as a consumer, this, this particular twist is exactly what you wanted, but change it slightly and it just, it doesn't work for you. That's really interesting. So when you're moving then to like, you said, you know, mentioned kind of prototyping. Um, I mean, one question is like, how do you assess when it's, all right, we're in a failed direction or this is like a failed iteration. In other words, like there's things that need to be tweaked. Like, how are you assessing your prototypes so that you're actually making progress versus, um, you know, just running an endless series of failed experiments? Um, I mean, there is a there is an art and science to going from idea to working product. Um, you know, the general kind of industry term for this is finding product market fit or the search for product market fit. And there is a lot of great sort of advice and methodology, and there's experts on it. I feel like I'm a student of this practice, and I probably have a, a set of original insights or original techniques that 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 I use and, and work well for me. But, but I don't, by no means do I think I'm the expert on that process. So, so I think what might be interesting is just to share a couple examples of how to, of how to think about it. Um, 
I think it's actually really helpful to think about um, a physical product. Like I, there's, I'm an investor in this company, Boom, which is building supersonic planes and, and have been acquaintance, uh, friends and acquaintances with the founder for a long time. And when you hear someone talk about a physical product like Tesla building a car or someone building a plane, one of the things that becomes really evident with physical products is how tightly coupled all of the, the attributes of the product are. Like, um, you know, for the product, for I'll use Tesla car as an example, like the, to, to have a certain range, you know, battery range, driving range, um, there's kind of a minimum range, which is desirable in the car, but, but when you increase the range, then it increases the weight of the car and that increases the cost of the car. And so eventually you, you could make a car that is exactly what consumers want, but is outside of what anyone could afford to, to, to pay. And so it's this, it's sort of balancing act of, do we understand what all of the constraints are that, that our solution needs to meet? And, and then can we build a solution that meets all of those? And sometimes you just can't, it's, you know, it's physically, it's physically impossible. It defies some law of physics to, in order to make something that is that, that light yet that strong, you know, and new materials are sometimes needed to be invented in order to get something that, that is that light yet that strong at the same time. But I think very often the process of going from this original, from this seed of an idea to solving it is, you know, I want to build an electric car for people and, and I think all that matters is that it can drive, you know, 300 miles on a single charge and, and it can be sold for under $200,000 or something like that. And then you, you get into the process and you sort of meet those two constraints and you do market further market testing. You realize, oh, that's not enough. People still don't want it because of this other reason, you know, the way it looks, the styling of the car matters a lot too. All right. So we have to meet goals one and two, and it has to be the most stylish car on the road. All right. So three constraints now let's solve for all three. And much of the process is sort of continually adding additional constraints that you have to meet before you make enough customers happy that there's a business to be built. So as somebody who has been in the education space and I know has thought a lot about education more broadly, um, I, I, there's a couple of things that come up when I talk to people who are whether they're actually from Silicon Valley, but they're in the kind of tech space or whatever, and they think about education. So one of them will be in effect that, um, you know, education should be encouraging entrepreneurship. And I mean, they often uh, judge that it doesn't. I'm curious what your take is on, first of all, do you even think that that's something that education should be striving to do? And if so, uh, or if not, like, what are the sort of implications for where we are right now? I think one of the interesting patterns to observe about people's opinions on education is they're they're very um, they're very often motivated by their own personal values. And so you talk with an artist, and they often feel like schools should spend more time teaching children the arts. And you talk with a um, you know, an entrepreneur, and they feel like schools should teach entrepreneurship. And you talk with a computer scientist, and they feel like they should teach programming. And so um, I, I, I try and fight that trend of thinking that schools should create kids like me. So I, you know, I'm aware of the kind of interests and, and motivations that I have. But I don't want to overgeneralize and think that all children should share the same interests and motivations that I do. So I mean, I think there are some general thinking habits that that um, are useful if you want to become an entrepreneur, which are useful even if you don't want to become an entrepreneur. So the ability to spot problems and frame questions clearly and, and you know, really, I just call it problem solving skills. So I think schools should absolutely teach generalizable problem solving skills. And I think to a large degree, they do. I mean, that is a part of many subjects in, in curriculum. And I think that can help people with entrepreneurship. Um, but I, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd go so far as to say education or schooling should should have a particular focus on entrepreneurship. Well, do you, do you think that there's any content areas or skill sets though that you think are kind of fundamental to the our ability to problem solve and kind of drive progress? Like, you know, if it's not trying to teach or encourage entrepreneurship ship directly, is there anything beyond just kind of general problem solving skills? that you think are like, no, this is what I'd want sort of any child to have um, in order to like, 
I mean, we could talk about in order to live a, you know, enjoyable, happy life, but I just want yeah. to focus on the uh, sense of being able to be productive and kind of help move. Yeah. I mean, forward. I, I think, um, yeah, if you think about the question of education, um, you know, it really is, it's, it's all predicated on, on this idea that there is a set of really important knowledge that we as a society have accumulated and we wanna pass some subset of this on to the next generation. And there's, there's this particular set of it, which is so important that every child should learn it. And the first 10 years of their life, 15 years of their life should be dedicated to you know, absorbing and integrating and acquiring this knowledge. And so you know, I agree with that general premise. And I think that there is a, a decent amount of really good thinking about what, you know, what that should consist of and you know, a certain amount of math and a certain amount of science and a certain amount of general reasoning skills. Um, but I think if I, if I could say anything sort of useful and, and novel on this subject, um, I think w when, you, when you take a step back and you evaluate the state of education and you ask yourself, you know, is it, is it good and, and how could it be made better? Um, I think there's a lot of ways it could be made better. And many of the challenges with making education better are just really, really hard problems. And I'll give you an example of one. Um, you know, I think it is widely acknowledged, um, and I think easy to see from your own experience, that the quality of a teacher can make a really big difference. So you take the same subject, the same curriculum, the same lesson plans even, and you put it in the hands of a teacher who's passionate about that subject and great at connecting with kids, or someone who's not, and, and it can be a completely different educational experience for the child. So, so the, the quality of the teacher matters. And there are few teachers who are really good or much better than the average. And so why can't every child get an education in each of the subjects from the best teacher out there um, or, you know, one of the, one of the best? Um, and, and, you know, if you pick other fields like music, like music is a field where we as consumers, you know, 150 years ago, used to experience music from the amateur down the street who played at the church or the town hall. And it was mostly live music. And that was our musical experience. Whereas nowadays you wanna to listen to anything like pianist or a, a rock band and you listen to the best in the world or you know, one of the best in the world. It's like we've moved from an industry of amateurs to an industry of experts. Whereas education is still very much in an industry of amateurs and, and where we're struggling as an industry, the industry struggling to take those great teachers and scale them up to reach millions or hundreds of millions of kids like music scales up. And I think there's a bunch of reasons why that's hard. The naive solution of simply, let's take that lesson and record it and then broadcast it on play to all of these other kids. So much gets lost in that particular transmission that doesn't with music or, you know, arguably live music at a concert is better than, than you know, great set of headphones and a, and a good album, but it's not that much better. Like the Delta there is much smaller than the Delta between a great live class and a recording of that class. So I think there's lots of important problems to improve on to take education to the next level. And many of them are just really hard. Um, but I think one, I think there's, there's at least one problem that I've seen that I think actually isn't that hard. So I think that, I think there's, I'll share, you, I'll share an example of what I think is kind of low hanging fruit in, in improving education. Um, and that is that, you know, from the perspective that education is about preparing children to live a happy and successful life. And you could debate, you know, what the definition of success is there. And I'll sort of sweep that aside for a second, but to live a happy and successful life. Um, one of the really key components is figuring out what you want to do as, as, as an individual who has a productive career. Like how, how do you play a role in the society? What, what job do you have where you can create value, where you can enjoy it and create value for other people? And um, that's a really hard problem that we each have to go through a you know, multi-decade journey to figure that out. And I think that's a problem that school doesn't really take seriously and doesn't help you try and solve. Mm. And, and in many ways um, has the opposite of the intended effect, like in its quest for standardizing and focusing on this set of core skills that we think are important. It, it sweeps away a lot of the individual differences and in, in your personal motivations and your unique interests and hobbies that might need to be understood and developed in order to turn them into a career. And so the consequence today is so many people get to college and you know, they check the kind of undeclared major box, like you're, 
you've been you've been at the schooling for, thing for at least 16 years by that point or you know 12 12 years by that point and you many people still feel completely lost on what they want to do for a career and that's I think that's a really fundamentally broken part of the education process. Yeah. I mean, I've heard you for a long time talk about, uh, you know, the importance of like cultivating your curiosity and interest when you're younger. And if you just think about the sheer way in which your time is kind of not, you know, self-determined, uh, even, uh, even when you get more latitude in high schools from a certain way, you can do what you want, but particularly if you're really focused on, I want to get into a great college and these things, then it's, oh, I have to be maxing out these classes. I have to be maxing out whatever extracurriculars look good on something. And you don't have time if you just become kind of fascinated with, you know, uh, web three or something like to just like spend 12 hours over the weekend uh, pouring yourself into it. And so it does kind of rob you of that, um, the, you know, the self-directed search for your interests and joy. And even aside from, from the time, I think the message that most of schooling and much of our society gives you is those things don't matter that much. Like worry about that later. You know, you got to get, you got to graduate and you need to get good grades and you need to get into college and you'll eventually figure that out. And, and I think the consequence of, of sort of demoting the importance of that, just, just in the narrative that, that, that children grow up with, um, it leads you to, to lose touch with whatever early signs you might've had about, about what your unique career should be. Yeah, and to the extent I can make myself sympathetic with that, it's, it's in this way, which is like most of the things that you know a young person gets in, it's easy to look at and go, that's not very practical. I mean, think about even the internet when you were young, Nobody was sitting around, you know, looking at you when you're 10 years old and be like, man, that's the ride to the top right there. It seems like an indulgence. It seems like, oh, that's kind of a cute little hobby, but it's not the stuff that's really important, really matters. And I think it's easy to take that, um, but even take something more plausible, right? Like, well, my kid likes to play video games or he likes to, my, my son right now just is memorizing all the Pokemon and like their relationships to one another. Yeah. And it's sort of easy to be dismissive, dismissive of that. Yes. But kind of my basic conviction is it's that sort of mental process of just getting excited about stuff and learning that ultimately will turn into something, even if not directly, like he's going to be a professional Pokemon card trader, but indirectly in, you know, whatever way sort of will naturally evolve. Yeah, no, I think that's a great example. And, and it's so easy for parents and for teachers to kind of have the reflexive reaction. Um, oh, you're spending all that time with Pokemon. Like that doesn't matter. Why don't you focus on something, you know, important that helps you with school, that, that is the education system values and, and so we get lots of signals that that those little side interests don't matter. Whereas, you know, once you sort of get into the real world, like kind of post-college career world, it, it's it's plainly evident to most grown-ups that in order to be successful at something, you have to work really hard. And it's hard to work really hard at something unless you really, really enjoy it. Otherwise, you're as soon as it starts to feel like a slog you know, you get this negative feedback loop of like, I'm not really enjoying this. So I don't want to work that hard on it. If I don't work that hard on it, I'm not actually going to be particularly good at it. And so my skills won't be particularly valued. And, and unfortunately, a lot of school kind of the lesson you get from school is you just got to suck it up and get through the slog. And that is such a dangerous lesson when, when we should be teaching children the exact opposite of, of figuring out how to connect outcomes to their own motivations and be in, stay in touch with their motivations. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, I was going to say it's funny, but I find it more tragic, which is usually that message happens to every level, right? Like, like, look, you're, you got to get into a good college. Like you, th you got to set aside what you're interested in now. And then it's college. Um, you got to, you know, you can worry about like that stuff once you're out of college and on your own. And then it's once you're there, no, you have to pay your dues and, you know, make sure you have career capital. Don't be kind of pursuing what you want. And then it just gets elevated until the point where, you know, somebody hits 40 and they can have the view, though I think it's even wrong then, but they can have the view of like, look, I'm trapped into whatever I'm doing. Right. And, yep. uh, and, and I, I've just seen too many instances of like really good people. I used to always have this question as a kid, like, how does somebody end up like that? I would never end up like that. And then I remember 
I was driving, I had gotten hired by a company as a professional writer. I'm driving across the country and my boss on the way out at this uh, government or this contracting company where he just wrote business proposals. Like I always wanted to be a writer, but you know, it's just one of those things that went by. And as I was driving out there, I had this realization that if I hadn't gotten this job, like I could see myself like, all right, this is pretty good for now. Oh, I got engaged. I got married. Oh, I have kids. Oh, I, I'm making a hundred grand now. I can't, I, I, I got to wait until I can replace that to do something else. And it just happens over time and through these yeah, constraints. Yeah. And so having that mentality early is important. Yeah. And I think some of the most exciting trends in education today are that people are starting to question the importance of college in a way that they haven't for, for as long as I've been alive, at least. Um, I think there's a real, there's an, a growing skepticism that should everyone go there and is it really worth the money and what are we teaching kids anyway? And, and, and you're seeing the emergence of, of sort of successful career tracks that don't require um, the, the, where, where college is less important. So I, you know, I think that's a good trend. I think the ability for people to self-educate through you know whatever recorded courses, however much worse they may be than live, like the fact that you can teach yourself a, a whole ton of things, you know, independently solo, thanks to the internet today, which would have been really difficult 50 years ago. Like those two trends, I think are probably the most encouraging trends. But the thing that I still think is missing is really an elevation and celebration of, of your own interests and values and, and seeing those as being important for, for solving the career question. So you've raised this point a couple of times in discussing education about like um, the, how much you lose, the, you know, if you just kind of like, let's stick a camera in front of a teacher. And so there's, there's just, there's something about being in person and I've been following, there's been a lot of interesting research that's come out over the last year about kind of the, what we're gaining and what we're losing by people moving more remote. And I mean, I, I know you recently moved from San Francisco, which a lot of other people have done. And there's kind of a real question of, is this going to be a net gain or a net cost to us as like Silicon Valley becomes more distributed throughout the, the country and the world. And so uh, what are your thoughts? And, and maybe even was that something that you worried about? Like, all right, I'm leaving this network of like some of the smartest, most, uh, you know, people on the cutting edge of technology and so on. Um, What's that going to, now you didn't move like me to the middle of nowhere in Michigan, but nevertheless, there's still, a, w did you run through that calculus and, and, and what are yeah, your thoughts yeah, on sort of remote definitely. versus in I, I was one of these ones that was really down on working remotely. I love going into the office and the energy of an office. And I was determined to reopen our office as soon as possible um, in San Francisco. We had an office in San Francisco and it took me many months to fully appreciate the, the benefits of remote and um and, and I think properly weigh the, weigh the pros and cons. And I'm now of the opinion that, that for me and my company, the benefits of being all remote outweigh the benefits of having an in-person office. Um, th there's things I miss out on and there's things I'm sad about, but, but I, I definitely went through that same sort of calculation as many people did. Um, are and, there any and, factors that you think are either non-obvious factors or that should most, that should at least for many people be weighted more differently than they might think. I think that um, even before the Zoom world, you know, that the remote life, I think that it's very easy for people to underestimate um, the value of being in a community of like-minded people who who reflect a particular ambition you may have. Um, you know, I think I think if you want to make movies, it's it's well it's it's widely understood. If you want to make movies, you should you should move to LA. You should you should be in Hollywood. Like that's where the industry is. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of people, I, I think the same holds true for technology in San Francisco. Um, and even though I'm out of San Francisco, I live in Austin now, I recently talked with a young person and my number one recommendation to, to that person was you should move to San Francisco. Like you just graduated college. You, you want to be an entrepreneur at building technology companies like San Francisco still has incredible benefits for you to reap. And it's, it's hard. It's not many of them are non-obvious and you don't really appreciate them until you're plugged in at that level. Um, and so I think that hasn't changed. Um, even though, you know, for, for me that the balance shifted, like I have many, many relationships that I get to bring with me and maintain regardless of where I am, because 
human relationships sort of span space and time in that way. But well, when it's, you're it's when you're trying to build them from scratch, it makes a, a much bigger difference to well, be in person. Uh, that really matches up. There's a paper that came out, and um, I'll try to remember and link in the show notes. But basically, what it was to, it was looking at uh, you know scientists who did co-authoring, and there didn't seem to be a cost at all. And indeed, I think there was a, a net gain. Um, in terms of how influential the papers were by citations or whatever, if they were remote, so long as they had kind of like met in person and like formed a real relationship. And I mean, I certainly look back on sort of the opportunities that have fallen my way and having like a foundation of being in a physical network was really valuable. And that made it a lot easier than, you know, 10 years later for me to go, well, I'm just going to be a writer wherever I, wherever I want. But I, but if I hadn't been kind of plugged into the universe that I had been physically, I don't like getting, building those relationships from scratch. I think um, it would have been much harder just because a lot of them are so much capital it is built up with just, oh, I, you know, I spent, you know, years having dinner with this person and like, you know, they know me personally and can trust me much more because they've dealt with me in a lot of contexts rather than just like, oh, this is, you know, Don's face on Zoom or an email I got from him. We are fundamentally social creatures. And um, being in the same room as someone still feels fundamentally different than than even a Zoom call like this. Like, I don't feel like I'm in the same same room as you. And to spend, I don't know, 10 hours with someone in the same room versus 10 hours with someone remotely, there is a difference in and what it feels like to connect with that person. And, you know, the same holds true for a live experience like this versus a recorded experience. Like anyone who's participated in a meeting live, a Zoom meeting, but even if they didn't say much, they, they were in the live Zoom meeting versus that those days where they missed the meeting and they listened to the recording. Like it feels fundamentally different to listen to a recording of a meeting than be in one live because we're social creatures. And we know someone on the other end is might respond to how we respond. And we have an opportunity to ask a question, even if we don't ask a question. And there's lots of little things. You know, I think some of them are, are sort of obvious and, and, and operate on sort of the, the, the active awareness level. But I think a whole set of them operate on, on a lower level that, that we're not explicitly aware of, just the way we feel towards a person or what it feels like to be in the same room as a person. You know, maybe the way people would talk about this most is if they've met a famous person. And, you know, it's like, why do people care about meeting, being in the same Starbucks line as some celebrity that they saw when, when they, they knew that person went to Starbucks because they saw the Instagram photo of that person on Starbucks. But it, it does, it feels really different for, for some set of reasons that I think half we can identify and half we still haven't put our finger on. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess then, because I, I do think it's a really interesting question of to what extent can technology solve that problem or close that gap and uh i mean it would you know it would be amazing if if like you could even like get 50 percent better at making meetings feel like being in the room with somebody i mean that, this that, is the metaverse that people talk about now you know if a year ago it was ar and vr and now the word for it is the metaverse but um but i but i you know, the, i think people who've spent any length of time in that technology the thing that's most exciting about it is the feeling of presence. Like you feel like you are in a different place. Like you are transported from your cubicle office to a mountainside or a meeting with a bunch of people. And, and you, when I've done, when I have done zoom meetings, you know, uh, video conferences in VR instead of over zoom like this, it's a trade-off. Like I, I would get the avatar of Don instead of the live Don, but, but, Right now, I even now, I think the avatar of Dawn in a room where we're sitting by a campfire feels more immersive and it feels more like I'm with you than the live square of you, which is our screen right now. So it's there's too much friction with the technology, so it's not caught on as a substitute for video conferencing, but it will within within five years. Um, will it'll be re- lots of these Zoom calls will be replaced with with VR and VR meetings. Well, awesome, Keith. Thanks for taking the time. We will have to do this in the metaverse next time. (laughs) And uh, in the meantime, everybody can go to ingenuism.com, sign up for our newsletter and see you then. Great talking with you.